Two Geeks, Two Beers podcast. Nerdy obsessions, drunken ramblings with Morgan Jeffrey and Tom Eames. I'd like to take his his face. Oh. Why is yours always so frothy? Hello and welcome to Two Geeks, Two Beers, a podcast of geeky, guilty pleasures, pointlessly discussed over a pint with me, Tom Eames, and of course, Morgan Jeffrey. Hello. And uh, we've reached our 90th episode. Can you believe it? I, I can't believe it. I didn't know it. I, I, I've long since stopped keeping track. <laughs> um, but that's that's nice. Nice, nice yeah. uh, milestone. Uh, well, for this episode, I have gone back to 1997, and it's uh, one of, in my opinion, the greatest action movies of all time. It has absolutely no right whatsoever being as good as it is, because on paper, it should just be ridiculed like it's some kind of straight-to-DVD mess from Steven Seagal or something, but it's actually, I would say, 133 minutes of utterly bonkers but brilliant 90s action. Uh <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about John Woo's Face Off, starring, of course, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage. So, coming up, the familiar faces who were first pictured in the roles before John and Nick, how it inspired an Oscar-winning film for Martin Scorsese, and how the setting and style of the film was meant to be entirely different to what we got. So, are you a fan of Face Off? I am a fan of Face Off. I, I, I haven't watched it for a good few years, and if I'm honest, I was probably drunk. When I when I watched it, so my oh yeah, almost certainly yeah. My you know, uh, best it's like best served cold, best delivered drunk, and um, I don't remember like a huge amount about it. I remember the basics. I remember that John Travolta is the good guy, Nicolas Cage is the bad guy. Famously, <laughs> yeah. they then sw- swap faces so that Travolta is the bad guy, Nicolas Cage is the good guy. <laughs> I remember that even when Travolta is the good guy, he has this weird creepy habit of i think he like touches his own face and then (laughs) touches other people's faces there's like a whole yeah yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of touching going on and and the the other thing that 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 stands out i forgot about that (laughs) the other other thing that really stands out is of course nicholas cage saying the line i want to take his face off which is one of the you know those it's beautiful those, it's beautiful it's incredible yeah. you know there's those moments in 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 films where someone says the title it's the peter griffin family back guy to moment the future of, yeah exactly it's, it's the peter griffin family guy moment of eh, eh, he said it he said it and there's there's some really good ones back to the future is a great one back to the future yeah really really <laughs> strong and one of the greatest ones of all time is i'm gonna take his face off really good really good <laughs> Do in James Bond do they normally say the line in every single film? Like uh, it, <laughs> this is this should be Patreon exclusive content if you want. <laughs> I can I can go through every single film and tell you whether or not they say the title. So Doc, Doctor No, yes they do. Obviously, it's the name of the the lead villain. All right, save it, save it. Let's do it for Patreon. Let's do, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> from from Russia yeah. we love. They they write it down, but they don't say oh, it. Right. This okay. is no, yeah. I'm not going to waste this on a free episode. You have to you have to pay for that kind of quality <laughs> content. Um, so uh, I I wrote this um, as the what I consider the Nicolas Cage sort of 90s action trilogy, which started mm. with The Rock and Con Air, Con Air. and Face Off. And it turned out that is actually a thing. When I was on um, Nicolas Cage's Wikipedia, it said it was it, there is is known as like the Cage action trilogy of those three films because they all came out pretty quickly, in within a very short space of time. Um, so you know, with this, you, you know, it's a John Woo film. So you know, you got chases, you got doves. gun gut doves, guns tossing in the air, uh, Mexican so, yeah, standoffs. So that's- that, that's that's guns being tossed in the air, not guns. Not comma. guns and tossing. Yeah. No, no, Mexican standoffs, um, is, you know, all, all the things that you expect from a John Woo film, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, you know. So, look, looking just basically in, into it, uh, it was written by uh, Mike Werb and Michael Caleri. And and I don't know if you, I don't know if you'll get onto this, but because those guys obviously wrote wrote the script. And yeah. I don't know if they came up with the title or if that was someone else's invention. But I want to—I want to know, really. Mm. What, what I hope we get to the crux of in this episode is who was the genius who? Because so, someone had the light bulb moment, right? Of going, right, 
It's called Face Off because <laughs> the two characters yeah. literally face off, but also yeah. we take their faces off. Like whoever, whoever whoever had that moment must have just been like, "I am I am a genius. This is this is the greatest <laughs> premise this, this, for a film of all time." It's the beautiful thing about the nineties is that um, back then they could come up with a really stupid premise mm. but make it work and and it's sort of, you know like speed it's just you're in a bus and it's got to stay above 50 otherwise it explodes that's the entire film and it works mm. same with this um and I, well the issue it, it sort of it found itself in is that people thought it was an ice hockey movie when they when they read the script so um we'll get onto it one of the actors I'll say his name later but he was interested because he thought it was an ice hockey biopic or something and then mm. read the script and was like this is nonsense it was actually um <laughs> John Woo's idea to put the slash in the title mm. because that helped it differentiate it from being some sort of weird ice. I don't know why that would make so much of a difference, but apparently that was that was enough to make people go, okay, so maybe this isn't just about the Mighty Ducks or something. Um, so, yeah, it stars John Travolta as an FBI agent and Cage as a terrorist, sworn enemies who assume each other's physical appearance. And apparently, Werb got the idea for the face surgery from a friend who had a hand gliding accident he had to remove most of his skin from the face and reconstruct Jesus. the bone matter and put his face back on. Now, that was from IMDb. <laughs> that is IMDb debatable. <laughs> I'd like to think I don't know why anyone would just make that up, but you know. And uh, but the thing is, right with this film. So, uh, I'm I'm sure you'll get onto it, but uh, yeah, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage swap faces. But it's but it's not just like it's not just like Nicolas Cage with John Travolta's face awkwardly it's, stitched hideously no. stitched onto his own. Somehow they also like swap body types and yeah. height oh, and yeah. weight well, and let's let's debate all that in a sec because okay. yeah that's that's quite a contentious <laughs> issue. Um, but yeah, it was the very first Hollywood film in which Wu was given major creative control. So he wow. directed his iconic Hard Boiled um, about five years before. And it is often cited as his best Hollywood film. Well, you know, it, it is a great film, but w- it's short, shortly after, right? Mission Impossible 2, which is yeah, yeah. underrated, underrated. And i got to say, it kind of stole the idea from jo- Face Off because of the whole nicking people's faces thing that they do in MI2 and then all went Mission Impossible films onwards. Well, sure, and and in the Mission Impossible TV series from the '60s, and I think in the first Mission Impossible movie as well. But um... of course, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, I thought MI2 was the first one of the films that had the uh, whole putting the face mask thing on. Or was it, no, was it the, uh, no. the first one? Oh, no. okay. Look, wait, I, I, look either it, way. It, in in yeah. in many ways, Face Off is a hugely influential movie <laughs> on on. Look, on, it's on... the most influential movie of all time. <laughs> okay, well, let's kick things off with the trailer for oh, Face Off. Yes. I've been uh, chasing this guy ever since I joined the force. He he has no conscience and he uh, he shows no no remorse. He's the mastermind behind numerous bombings and political assassinations. He uh, has a felony list a mile long: murder, arson, kidnapping, terrorism, you name it. He's the most dangerous and brilliant criminal mind I've ever known. I, for years, I've I've been watching him, tracking him, studying his every every move. I know his every every mannerism, facial tick, gesture. I know him better than he knows himself. And now, after all this time, I finally figured out a way to trap him. I will become him. care if I live. You're not having any fun, are you, Sean? Try terrorism for hire. We'll blow some stuff up. It's more fun. Plan B. Let's just kill each other. All right, do you want to describe the uh, the sort of pre- premise of that trailer? Because again, a, tra- a trailer based almost entirely around a, a, visu- a visual hook. Yeah. Does not really translate well, the whole, to audio. No. I mean, it's, again, it's one of those... Tra- I, I was searching for other trailers, and it's one of those trailers which is mostly music. Because <laughs> no, it doesn't even have the voiceover man going, John Travolta, and all that kind of stuff. So I'll 
edit a lot of that out. But uh, they, um, so in that, it was, it was one of those great examples of a trailer where they film stuff specifically for the trailer. Because obviously that that scene of John Travolta there, he wasn't that isn't in the film. That's him, his character explaining what's going on. So he's he's talking about being obsessed with this guy, and he turns round in the shadows, and as he comes back round again, he's now Nicolas Cage. Although. Um, Although, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, but I, I think that... Maybe I'm misremembering, but does that trailer not fundamentally miss, missell the, the, the premise of, and plot of the movie? Because that seems to imply that, like, John Travolta was like, yeah, this guy, Nicolas Cage, here's how I'm going to catch him. I'm going to become him. But yeah. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure in the film, it's Nicolas Cage who steals John Travolta's face to, like, get back in him, not the other way around. Well, Travolta does it first. Does he? And then yeah, yeah, yeah. and then all right, and then all Cage, right. and then Cage all right. come gets yeah. So. Do you know what? Do you know what? I'm I'm sorry I questioned the plot of Face. I'm, I'm s- <laughs> it's, it's a very simple plot, and you're you're you know you're you're getting too complicated here. Anyway, right. so uh, Face Off began as a spec script, which writers Werb and Cleary optioned to Joel Silver and Warner Brothers back in 1991. Uh, Werb had previously written the screenplay for The Mask. Um, and he went on to write uh, Lara Croft Tomb Raider alongside Kaleri. And Kaleri now is the showrunner for a show I didn't know existed, The Professionals, starring Tom Welling and Brendan Fraser. What? But I looked, up, I looked it up, I was like, is it a remake of The, the Professionals? And I was like, well, and on Deadline... What? I'm sorry, Tom, Tom Welling and, and Brendan Fraser yeah. as, as Bodie and Doyle? Surely well, not. I look, but I looked it up and it says, on Deadline, this was uh, in... T- May 2019, Brendan Fraser is to star in The Professionals, a loose remake of the Christian Slater-fronted action movie Soldiers of Fortune. <laughs> but it's for Scandinavian SVOD service via play. There's too many streaming services. If this What's is... that? I don't think that ever happened. 2019, I don't well, think apparently, that ever no, Apparently it has happened. It apparently is, it is there. It's on IMDb. It does, doesn't have a Wikipedia page, but it does exist. Yeah, if Soldiers. do you remember Soldiers of Fortune? It says it's a tongue-in-cheek no. action film from 2012 starring Christian Slater and Dominic Murnahan and Sean Bean. <laughs> and Ving Rhames. Sounds amazing. <laughs> amazing. And so they thought, let's, let's, let's take that and make it. a TV show. Yeah, yeah what's the point? Oh dear! But anyway, that's happened. But yeah, not not the professionals because I think you're going to do an episode of that one day, aren't you? So, sadly, that is not that is not what that is. Um, anyway, so that's that's what Cleary's doing now. Um, Warner Brothers uh, weren't interested. Were later said, I don't think that they ever really understood the script. Stallone was attached to Demolition Man, and we were over there with our movie, and so they saw the two movies as being too similar. So they made one, and ours got shelved. Now. Maybe the original idea was a bit more like Demolition Man. I, I don't say, know. That, that, <laughs> that is that is future episode fodder. I love yeah. I love Demolition Man. It's so genuinely great. I like that. Like this yeah. on paper seems like it would be dreadful, but oh my god, it's such a good movie. But nothing like Face Off. I don't. <laughs> no. uh, other than I mean, Demolition Man does have a face off between Stallone and Wesley Snipes, <laughs> but at no point do they actually exchange exchange faces. No, that doesn't happen, no. No. Um, Well, the option for the script expired in 1994 and the project was purchased by Paramount and then John Woo became attached in 96 and the first actors who were envisioned by the writers to play Sean Archer and Castor Troy were... Can you guess? (laughs) I think think I've heard this and I think we always joke about these two names but I think think genuinely was it Arnie and Stallone? (laughs) It was Arnie and Stallone, yeah, yeah. yeah. Finally, yeah, it was, yeah. So, um, but that, yeah, that, apparently, that would have that, been amazing. Yeah, the, the film, the film as we as it emerged, finally, is great. But yeah, uh, I mean, that would have been on another level. Like for the first, what would have been? I mean, you know, if we're thinking about you know those two icons of action coming together for yeah. the first time, I'd argue maybe like a slightly better project than Escape Plan. Um, well, I was going to say, we, we, all we got was Escape Plan. I remember how excited we were to watch Escape Plan. Mm. We finally sat down and we watched it. We can't, I, can't, I was like, by an hour in, I was sort of on my phone. I wasn't really paying attention. I was like, how, is, how am I getting bored <laughs> of a prison break thriller, action and thriller with Stallone and Arnie and I'm bored? Mm. Couldn't believe it. It was, it was that and Bullet, was it Bullet to the Head? Bullet to the Head. With Stallone. Yeah, uh. there, there are certain films. This film, this <laughs> Face Off is a film that on paper seems dreadful, but is actually f- phenomenal. And Bullet to the Head is the exact opposite, where you go, what's the film? Stallone, yeah. And he's like, I don't know, I can't remember. He's a cop or something. Who's his partner? Han from Fast and the Furious. Brilliant. <laughs> Who are they fighting? Jason Momoa. Brilliant. <laughs> what's the film called? 
bullet to the head. Yes, yes. I want to watch it right now. That sounds incredible. Uh, and it's just no. Re- really like, boring. Dre- really really boring. Yeah. The worst. The worst crime. Because it being bad is one thing, but boring. How do you yeah. make? Yeah. How do you make? How do you make that film boring? But they managed it. Anyway, anyway, that's a little. Uh... A uh, little uh, rant about the weird sort of Stallone films of the mid to late 2010s. Yeah, so John Woo instead hired uh, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage to play those characters. Um, Travolta had worked with Woo on Broken Arrow the year before. Um, Stop, which, and- which, which starred uh, Christian Slater, star of uh, <laughs> Soldiers of Fortune. <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah. Um, a Paramount apparently wanted, um, instead of uh, Cage, Johnny Depp. Huh? Would you believe? Uh, who would, you know, is a lot younger, you know, a good f- six, seven years before Pirates. Um, and Michael Douglas actually served as an executive producer on the film, which I didn't know about. Um, I'll have a more about him later. Uh, but yeah, Depp refused that. And he, again, Depp was the guy I was talking about earlier who thought it was an ice hockey movie and uh, decided against it. Um, the writer's first version was actually set in the future, so maybe this is the Demolition Man uh, angle, um, mainly to explain the face transplanting technology, um, to say this is why we can do it, because it's set in the future. <laughs> but then but then they just went, move it to the present day, and, yeah, fu- fuck, and it. fuck it. Yeah, fuck it. <laughs> but apparently it was Wu who wasn't interested. Um, he said, I just felt I hadn't learned enough to make a great sci-fi movie. Um, he told another interviewer, I want more character, more humanity. If there is too much science fiction, we lose the drama. So as the uh, project evolved at Paramount, the writers removed the futuristic elements and instead focusing on the characters. And I think it's set in like 2002 or something. So I think it's set in the near future. Woo's like, look, the face swapping, I'm on board with. But (laughs) saying it in in 2036, I'm out. That's where where I draw the line. Exactly. So, the film follows FBI Special Agent Sean Archer, played by John Travolta, who survives an assassination attempt by freelance terrorist and homicidal sociopath Castor Troy, played by Nicolas Cage. But the uh, bullet penetrates Archer's chest and strikes his son Michael, killing his son instead. I just like the idea of freelance terrorists. I know, freelance... (laughs) Pay your pay your freelance terrorists. Yeah, no, I really like 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 there are some terrorists who are like part of a union, but he's yeah. a but he's a freelance terrorist. Uh, six years later, Archer's vendetta against Troy leads to his team's ambush of him and his younger brother uh, Pollux at a remote desert airstrip. Um, and you just got to love Nicolas Cage's introduction as Castor Troy. Um, just the whole you just like oh, it's like you're watching WAP or something. I just. Nicolas Cage, whether you rate him or whether you don't rate him, the one thing you cannot deny is that he will deliver dialogue in a way that you you cannot you cannot predict. No one could have yeah. no one. No one, You can read the script and you can you can know the general direction in which the scene is going, but you cannot predict that. Even like even very basic lines, he will just sprinkle a little bit of his head, of his. <laughs> he's like he's like he's like um. Salt Bay. Salt Bay. <laughs> yeah, he just sprinkles a little bit of cage flavor. Like, it's a li- like obviously there's some like ludicrous lines in 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 that scene, but there's one bit where he what, what, he just says something about um. Come on, let's go. And well, that, I'm bored. That, let's go. But that, but also when he says about the famous um our famous faces. Yeah. And, and rather than just say our famous faces, he goes our famous faces. Like he just gives it like a little sprinkle of cage, and it's like ele- elevates it, elevates it. I think the only person who's more rogue is Del Toro for reasons we've spoken about before on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, no. I would love oh. I would love to see a scene of Nic- Nicolas Cage just kind of going crazy and then <laughs> and then Benicio Del Toro on the other end being like don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh, oh. Why why has that fun. never happened? Why is that? I know. So, uh, Troy goads Archer with knowledge of a bomb located somewhere in LA, set to go off in a few days, but he is knocked into a coma before Archer can learn more. At the suggestion of his colleagues, apparently this is the first suggestion they came came up with, uh, Archer reluctantly, secretly undergoes a highly experimental face transplant procedure by Dr. Malcolm Walsh to take on Troy's face, voice and appearance. So, here we are. We've mentioned it briefly. Mm. Yes... It, it, there's the whole face thing. Let's say let's say that's that works somehow. Yeah, I, th- I think they're the same sort of height. Let's just say they're the same Fine. height. Let's, just, let's, let's you know. Let, let's like give it the benefit of the doubt and say they're roughly the same height. Yeah. Now, at this point, Nicolas Cage was pretty buff. He's quite a thin action star. 
Now, I'm not saying John Travolta's fat, because he isn't at all. But he's quite... Stocky. He's a, he's a, he's a bit stocky in comparison to Cage. Now, it's not... Ex- it, they don't, they do sort of explain it in the, in the thing when they're when they're doing the um the whole f- procedure. In fact, I'm going to get it up now, um because they do mention his um I'm pretty sure they mentioned love handles and all sorts. So let's let's wow. see if this actually explains it properly. <laughs> let's watch the film <laughs> and then <laughs> and then decide whether or not it makes sense. What we're suggesting for you, Archer, isn't a permanent transplant like that, just a temporary trade. With the new anti-inflammatories, healing takes days, not weeks. Your blood types won't match, but Pollux won't know that. Height difference is negligible. I guess that makes more sense than the, if it was the other way, where they're like yeah. pi- piling weight onto Nicolas Cage, which they also yeah. which they also do later in the yeah. movie. Yeah, good point. So, like the doctor that he's forcing, which we'll get onto in a second, he has to like. I, um, I guess like <laughs> like do the reverse. Tra- Travolta Travolta underwent liposuction, yeah. and then and then he just sort of like pumped it into Cage. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Don't worry about it. But I love it. It's like, uh, yeah, normally this would take uh, weeks to recover from. This is just, uh, yeah, just a couple of hours. Don't worry about it. Uh, but one other thing, we mentioned Mission Impossible, but also before this was made, Red Dwarf did the body swap episode, which is, which I'd say is very similar. Do you remember that one? Where um, Lister and Rimmer swap bodies for the, for the for a few days. So it's, okay. it's again. Again, yeah. again, though, probably not, probably not the genesis of the idea <laughs> of two people... Swapping bodies. I believe. I believe the first ever uh, piece of media um, in, w- in which that was uh, tackled was The Parent Trap, starring Haley Mills. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know. But what I, my point is, it was probably a thing prior to yeah. that. But yeah, something we tried once on the Nova Five. It uses exactly the same science as generating a hologram. We wipe all your brain patterns and put them on a storage disk. Then we transfer the captain's mind from his hologram personality disc into your empty brain. And you tried this in the Nova 5? Oh, yes. Did it work? No, but I'm pretty sure I know what went wrong. So Archer was taken to the same high security prison where Caster's brother Pollux is being held and slowly convinces Pollux that he is Troy, gaining information on the bomb's location. Meanwhile, Troy unexpectedly awakens from his coma and discovers his face is missing. Um... <laughs> He calls his gang and they force Dr. Walsh to transplant Archer's face onto him. I hate it. I hate uh, it when that happens. I hate it when you wake up and your face is missing. <laughs> Nightmare. Uh, Troy then kills Archer's colleagues and Walsh, so they were the only three who knew of the transplant. So the only people that knew it happened are dead. Um, at the prison, Archer prepares to tell his team of the location, but is surprised when Troy appears instead with Archer's face. So, are we, so we're meant to buy that... <laughs> They 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 cut off Nicolas Cage's face, attached it to John Travolta, mm. went through all all of that, and somehow got like the clearance to do all that. Only three people knew about it, and there were and there was no like running it up the ladder to get approval. There was no there were no like it wasn't in the cloud. There were there weren't any like <laughs> a, sign off approval documents in the cloud. It, like Look, it's it, need to know, right? It's it's uh, uh it's, yeah. it's classified. Yeah. Sure, sure. It's that easy yeah. to cover it up. All right, all right. <laughs> I still, I also can't like comprehend. That's the guy from Greece. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. No, it's I, just... I, you know, I get that. I get. There's like young Travolta, who's the, you know, who's the guy from Saturday Night Fever in Greece. Yeah. And, and then there's like post Pulp Fiction Travolta. Yeah. And I'm not entirely convinced they are the same person. No. I think we might be looking at a Paul McCartney, Avril Lavigne yeah. situation, where <laughs> it's it's some kind of doppelganger. It's a it's a clone. <clears throat> there's there's something going on there where like it's. I don't. There's where's where's in between Travolta and and look. <laughs> I know. And look, maybe there's evidence of you know between his sort of Greece Saturday Night Fever heyday and his Pulp Fiction comeback. Maybe there's just a bunch of movies there that no one wants to see, and they will prove that, that it's the same person. But I'm not going to go watch those movies, so I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that it's it's two different people. <laughs> Well, you got uh, the Staying Alive film, which no one remembers, which was Travolta and uh, Olivia and you, and John teaming uh, up. Do, do, do you know who directed that? Staying Alive? No. The, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever? No. Sylvester Stallone. Was it? Bringing oh, it, amazing. Bringing it full, well, not quite full, I don't know, full circle, is it? I don't know. Yeah, I got that mixed up. Olivia and John's not in that. It's just it's just a Saturday Night Fever um, uh, sequel. But anyway, anyway, Carol. Um <laughs> 
So it is very clever, though, in a very strange way. You get very quickly used to Cage being the good guy and, and Travolta, the bad guy, having watched the first. It's it, you can And you can see both actors taking on elements of how the other one is, and it's, it is quite the mindfuck for what is meant to be a very <laughs> simple film. I was, yeah, I was, I don't know, I was watching that scene, and I was thinking, Travolta is sort of channeling Cage. He's kind of doing his best, yeah. his best Cage. But I think Cage is so inherently Cage... That he can't, he can't be anyone else. So he's, no. well, he's not... C- Cage is, is, he hams it up really loads when he's pay- playing Castor Troy. Mm. And then when he becomes Travolta, he's now being like the Con Air kind of stoic. I've got not much of a personality, but I'm still, I'm, I'm still a bit wacky every now and then. But I'm, I'm keeping it, I'm keeping it on the down low as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Um, so Pollux is freed when he willingly tells Troy as Archer of the bomb's location um, and Troy disarms the bomb in dramatic fashion so he he knows where the bomb is obviously but he, he disarms it to be a hero and all this kind of stuff um, he earns admiration from the FBI and becomes close to Archer's wife Eve and daughter Jamie whom Archer had been neglecting when he was chasing down Troy before so now he's sort of moving in on his family as well Meanwhile, Archer as Troy escapes after staging a riot and retreats to Troy's headquarters, posing as Troy, leading to another brilliant cage moment when he's playing Travolta as Archer, being forced to take drugs to prove he's part of the gang. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not to, not to criticise, but <laughs> Travolta went undercover as Cage and, and, mm. to- and told like three people and there was no record of it beyond the physical records that Cage as Travolta destroyed. Likewise, Cage adopted Travolta's face and didn't tell any of his any of his mates. They weren't. They didn't know any of this was happening. It's a they, good point. They can't have done because then he comes back as Cage and they don't know. Surely, they, they they're not in the loop on any of this. But I thought he had a had a gang that came and helped him when he did the face thing. That's the whole point because his gang came and rescued him and maybe they they must have died along the way. <laughs> But they weren't anyway. They weren't any of these lot. Let's just say that he's got a whole new gang. Yeah. He's got a whole new gang. Yeah. These guys yeah. are not in the loop. Okay. Okay. Fine. Look, look I, I didn't do my research and watch the film recently. I've just remembered it from watching it about five years ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Troy learns of Archer's escape and assembles a team to raid his headquarters. So a different team, I assume. Uh, the raid quickly turns into a bloodbath, killing numerous FBI agents and several members of Troy's gang, including Pollux. Uh, Archer approaches Eve and convinces her to test Troy as Archer's blood to prove his identity. Um, convinced of her husband's identity, Eve tells Archer that Troy will be vulnerable at the funeral of Lazaro, which was uh, Archer's director of the FBI who was killed by Troy in another scene. So at his funeral, Archer finds that Troy has anticipated his actions and takes Eve hostage. A gunfight begins, Troy flees the church, well, Archer pursues him, and then you get like a, a speedboat chase, which goes on. Remember in MI2, you had that motorbike chase, yeah. which goes on for about half an hour. Same with this, with the, the speedboat. Archer forces Troy to the shore, then beats Troy in a fight, but then Troy starts mutilating his own slash Archer's face to taunt him. Uh, but Archer finally impales Troy with a spear gun and killing him. Um, backup agents arrive and arrest and, and address Archer by name, having been convinced by Eve of Archer's true identity. Now... That's all well and good, but how do you, how in a space of in a very short space of time did Eve manage to sort of convince everyone? Oh, d- look, just go along with it. It's not really. It is my husband. Just, 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 just trust me. He's yeah. the baddie. Don't kill him. Kill that one. Also, you know, if like you know, you lop off the end of a finger, and it's mm. like put that in ice straight away. And if you yeah. do, and if you do, we can like reattach it. What's what is the rule with faces? So like, yeah. he's he's just killed Castor Troy with a spear gun. He's dead. Is there a certain point at which the face is no longer salvageable? Can it get there? Yeah. Like, look, quick, put, quick put, put the whole thing on ice. Yeah, put all of Nicolas Cage on ice so that we can at some point take his face Plus, off. Plus, you've just yeah. stabbed him with the spear gun thing. You need all the fat reserves that were once Travolta's <laughs> that you've put into Cage. You need to get it back and put it back in you. Maybe, um, oh. may, maybe, yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. Yeah, gotta, you've got to save those fat reserves. Um... And then another thing, I remember in the, in the speedboat bit and the whole thing, in the olden days, pre, even DVD, well, actually pre-Blu-ray, so when it was like VHS, TV or DVD, you could probably get away with certain things because the quality wasn't 
the best. Once you had like Blu-ray and a Super HD, <laughs> you could pause things and you could see stuff which you wouldn't normally see as 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 quality. And so there are bits where they're fighting and stuff, and it's clearly not them doing all the stunts. Yeah, there's a bit in the air where they're just in the air. <laughs> And it's like, well, it's not John Travolta's face. <laughs> I can see it's not John Travolta. And it's Whereas not back in the day. You wouldn't, you know. It's not John Travolta's face, and it's not Nicolas Cage's it's, face either. It's neither of their faces. Iron- ironically, <laughs> there's two other faces. I know. Who are they? What? Ah, oh, <laughs> the irony. The irony. Yeah. Um, so after the face transplant surgery is reversed, don't ask how it just is. Do um, you- Archer. <laughs> so I was just thinking about that, right? And like they, so presumably, like they they get Castor Troy's corpse remove and and they remove John Travolta's face from it yeah. and and then put it back on his body what do they mm. what do they do with Nicolas Cage's face do they stitch it back onto his corpse or do they just sort of put it in a bin <laughs> Just, just sort of drape, just drape it there. Because there's no point. The, yeah. I, I don't imagine. I don't imagine like Nicolas Cage. I don't imagine Castor Troy is going to have like, a big funeral with an open no. cas- with an open casket. It's probably not. Like, no. They probably just like leave his corpse faceless and just put his face in the bin. I imagine Archer would probably want to hang it up somewhere as a, like a <laughs> like a taxidermy type situation. <laughs> it's just got Nicolas Nicholas Cage's stuffed corpse. Just yeah, just somewhere as a memento. Um, so yeah Archer returns home and it's all happily ever after um, again won't translate to audio so I won't bother playing it but I just remember it for when Travolta appears with his nice cheeky grin going hey I'm back and he does that that stroke thing that he mentioned yeah he, yeah, he, yeah. T- he touches his daughter's face in a, in a weird imagine imagine like that's the that's the good one the guy yeah. <laughs> the guy who creepily touches your face he's yeah. he, he's the one you were rooting for he's the one you went around but I think um, if I was Travolta I'd have been like can I keep? Can I keep the abs? Is that right? Can I? <laughs> yeah, can surely, I keep... surely. Once they stitched his face, I get wanting your face back. But surely they're not like. And I get, I get as well. Yeah. Well, they've they've removed, they've presumably removed some of Travolta's hair, so that he has yeah. Cage's hairline. So he's like, right, put my hair back on. Fine, but surely he's not like put return return me my love handles. <laughs> surely I not. Think he, well, there's a bit where he says, um, I've got a bullet wound here that I want to keep because it reminds me of my son and all that kind of stuff yeah. but definitely I'd want to I'd want to get rid of yeah, the, the belly yeah, yeah it's like it's like one up, one upside of this whole terrible experience is I yeah. keep I keep Nicolas Cage's physique but just put my now, John Travolta face on top of it did they bother with the penis <laughs> because what? I suppose if you want to go deep undercover you know in case someone knows what your penis looks like you well, have to and, do everything and you know if there's variation i guess there's a, a, there might be a difference in how deep undercover you're going do you know what i mean, <laughs> what I mean. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. No, that is that's yeah. interesting but again but again it's like if let's say let's let's say for you know for for the, for this discussion let's say the, <laughs> theoretically that uh nicolas cage has a bigger penis than john travolta yeah okay yeah. so so he's like Right, yeah, they're going to give me a penis extension. This is great. But do you think that Sean Archer was so dedicated that if that if Castor Troy had a smaller penis, he'd be like, <laughs> "I'm all right with you lopping a bit off the end, <laughs> so that so that I'm really it, there's no like my co- my cover is absolutely foolproof." Exactly. But then well, and then, yeah, and then, yeah. then he's like, "No, put it back on. Put it. I want <laughs> I want my old John Travolta penis back." This might be the uh, stupidest episode we've ever done. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that was a quick run through of the plot. I didn't want to. I've, I've, I've done this before. Where I've spoke. I've, I've just butchered it entirely. So hopefully that was not as painful as Air Bud. I put it that way. Um, so let's go for the cast. Obviously, John Travolta. You know, we've spoken about it already. He had his kind of nineties renaissance thanks to Pulp Fiction three years before this. Um, and this was one of the films that kind of cemented him as a big box office draw in the 90s. Uh, Get Shorty was another big one. Oh. But the, uh, Battlefield Earth was only two years away after this. Oh. So, you know. Imagine that, what, that you got you got your, your Pulp Fiction, your Face Off, Get Shorty, yeah. and then Battlefield yeah. Earth. Oh, yeah. how, how it went wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nicolas Cage had become perhaps quite a surprising action star. Um, the Rock had come out the year before, and amazingly, this this I didn't realise. Con Air was released the same month as Face Off in 1997. Wow! So Face uh, Con Air came out on June 6th, and then Face Off was June 27th. What a one-two so, punch from Cage! Incredible, yeah, incredible. Um, so before The Rock, he hadn't really done that much action. He was best known for you know films like Leaving Las Vegas, which he won an Oscar for, um, and Raising Arizona. 
Um, but it was very much like 96, 97 that he became like a Hollywood, you know, heavyweight. Um, Joan Allen played Archer's wife Eve. She had been nominated for Best Supporting Actress and uh, t- twice in the, uh, in the Oscars before Face Off for Nixon and The Crucible. Uh, and then she did Face Off. So there's, so, there's, so, there's so many like Oscar yeah. nominees and like yeah. credible yeah. actors in this movie and the end result is yeah. Face Off. I love it. Uh, and she's since had a third, actually, since then. Um, she starred opposite Nicolas Cage and Peggy Sue got married 10 years before. Um, and in recent years, she's probably best known for playing Pamela Landy in the Bourne films. Oh, yeah. Um, Alessandro Nivola uh, played Pollux Troy. Um, he's quite a prolific that guy actor. I know that producer. name. Yeah. yeah. He's been in lots and lots of different things. But I've got to say, he, he plays it very odd. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if I've seen him in anything else, but you saw him in that clip earlier. Yeah. He was like... Oh brother, I don't know what you're doing. It's like he's swallowing all his lines. Like he, that's that's the vision he had for the character. Maybe maybe um, maybe he's like he's seeing what Cage is doing, and he's like, I've got to do yeah. some. I've got to do something to try and, <laughs> if not compete, at least match what he is doing. Uh, and he is married with two kids with Emily Mortimer, which I, is what? Little... I did not know that. Also, yeah. I, I, it's definitely like a choice that he's making with his performance. But your imita- yeah. your imitation of it there was like so, some kind of like constipated northerner who's like, oh, bro- brother, oh, it's like Sean, like Sean Kit Sean, Harrington having the runs, <laughs> or oh. Sean Bean in one of his many death scenes. Oh, oh. Anyway, carry on. Um, Gina Gershon played Troy's baby mama Sasha um, she's always great in everything she's in uh, Dominique Swain played Archer's daughter she's probably best known for the title character in the 97 remake of Lolita opposite Jeremy Irons so very much the year for her um, she's now aged 40 she's still acting but largely appears in kind of independent and horror films uh, there were also supporting roles for lots of other great actors we've got John Carroll Lynch uh, Colm Fjord, uh CCH Pounder was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robert Wisdom, uh, Nick Casavets, Tommy Flanagan, Thomas Jane, and many more. Um, and on an eighty million pound budget or dollar budget, it made over two hundred forty five million at the wow. box office, and it received positive reviews. Why? Yeah, up until now, I was I was well on board. Now I'm like a box. <laughs> uh, uh, do you know what? It does. It does. Though have a cult following because. <laughs> If it, it does. If it's if it's a box office success with positive reviews and no cult following, <laughs> yeah. what's the point? Get out. Yeah. Not on this yeah. podcast, sir. No, no. It does at least have a cult following. It's weird. It made a lot. I mean, it shows how much you know. It made a lot of money, two hundred forty-five million, but it was only like fourteenth biggest film of the, of ninety-seven. It wasn't like one of the biggest films, but you know, on, on, it, it made a lot of money. Um, and Rotten Tomatoes it has a ninety-two percent score. <laughs> Uh, the website's critical consensus reads, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage play cat and mouse and literally play each other against a beautifully stylized backdrop of typically elegant, over-the-top John Woo violence. I'd agree with that. Uh, the role reversal between Travolta and Cage was praised by many reviewers, as were the violent action sequences. And Ebert, he gave the film three out of four stars. And he said, uh, here, using big movie stars and asking them to play each other, Wu and his writers find a terrific counterpoint to the action series. Although all through the movie you find yourself reinterpreting every scene as you realise the other character is really playing it. Yeah, that's how that's how that's how it works. It blew it blew it blew yeah. Ebert's mind. I like that. You can believe e- it. Yeah. Ebert, Ebert, who has been around for He thought he'd seen it all. Yeah. He thought he'd seen it all. <laughs> and he's like, Do you know what has really blown my mind? <laughs> Fucking face off, man. I face off. Yeah. I cannot believe it. Uh, Rolling Stone's Peter Travis said, uh, you may not buy the premise or the wind-up, but with Travolta and Cage taking comic and uh, psychic measures of their characters and their own careers, there's no resisting face-off. This you gotta see. Uh, Richard Corliss of Time said that the film isn't just a thrill ride, it's a rocket into the thrilling past when directors could scare you with how much emotion they packed into a movie. And then Barbara Scholgasser said uh, the movie was idiotic, but <laughs> argued that a, a, a good director would choose the best of the six ways and put it in the, in his movie. However, Wu puts all six in. <laughs> if you keep your eyes closed during a Wu movie and open them every six minutes, you'll see everything you need to know to have a perfectly lovely evening at the cinema. I was like, oh, yeah. I, th- yeah, is, I think that's work. a good review, I think. <laughs> yeah. So let's go through a few facts for Face Off. Face Off facts. Um, so Nicolas Cage and John Travolta spent two weeks together before filming in, in order to learn how to play each other. Um, they decided on specific gestures and vocal tics for each character that could be mimicked. So why did no one make a documentary out of that? Yeah. Of, of them two hanging out for like two weeks and just seeing what it was like. That would be amazing. Um, 
Face Off is said to have inspired Internal Affairs um, with director Andrew Lau. He wanted to have a more realistic situation and instead of a, a physical face change, he wanted to have the characters swap identities. But Internal Affairs, in turn, has spawned several adaptations, notably The Departed, directed by Martin Scorsese, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. So you could say Face Off inspired The Departed. Yeah, there we go. That's that's how, that's how you got to that. I think I think it's Infernal Affairs because it's a it's is a, it it's a play on it's a play it on. is Infernal. Of course it is. Of course it is. It's in- a play. Oh, do you know what? It's a play on words. It's a play on words. Like much, it, it, much it was lost on me. Much it was lost on me. Much, much like but... face. Much like face off. It is a very very clever play, <laughs> on, play on words. Oh uh, dear. Yeah, Infernal Affairs. I apologise. Um, the first real face transplant in uh, was accomplished in 2012. Hang um, on. I, uh, well, I guess I was going to say I thought the first I thought a a face transplant inspired yeah. the, inspired the film when the writers make, and it, but I guess well, that, was, that 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 was yeah. his that was his own face his own face yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like I, I want to take my face off and put it back and on. on again yeah and then yeah. on again whereas this was yeah what no yeah, they no. they've never swapped anyone's face for real though right. Well, it says in 2012, Richard Norris, who'd accidentally shot himself in the face with a shotgun, ironically, the same year the movie came out. So in 1997, he, he, he accidentally <laughs> shot himself and then right. uh, got a face transplant years later. A couple, there's a couple of things there, and I don't mean to make light of the situation, but one, how the fuck do you sh- accidentally shoot yourself in the face with a shotgun? <laughs> and, t- and two, do you think he watched Face Off and was like, I'll have a bit of that action? <laughs> And again, I think this was a Carl Pilkington thing, but can you choose the face? <laughs> can you? Can you? Yeah. Can you, yeah. I yeah. think it was a whole thing that he was trying to explain. Wasn't who's, it? Whose face am I getting? And more importantly, whose penis am I getting? <laughs> the main character is named. Is it this? Well, we're getting into a bit of um, a bit of culture now. Uh, the main character is named Sean Archer, Sagittarius the Archer. One of the constellations of the zodiac is diametrically opposite, or halfway around the year from the constellation Gemini. Castor and Pollux are the two major stars in the constellation Gemini. So there you go. That's that's how they wow how they got to that one. Yeah, this, this movie. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's a it's a it's a lot more cultured this movie than you'd expect. Uh, this is a bit more. This is more IMD debatable. Uh, this bit. Um, we're getting into other actors considered for the roles. So oh, this will be fun. So we already had. So these are other pairs, apparently, other pairs of actors who were considered. So you had you had Arnie and Stallone. Yeah. Um, can you guess other ones? Um, Richard Gere and Richard Dreyfus. Um, uh, no, sadly not. Uh, who are who is who are, Jeff Jeff Bridges and Jeff Daniels? Uh, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, uh, Dermot Mulroney and Dylan McDermott. <laughs> um, no, go on, tell me. Uh, so you had um, Harrison Ford and Michael Douglas, which would have been amazing. I mean, so Douglas w- apparently he was up for it, yeah. and then that's why he ended up executive producing it. But imagine that—that that would have been a more geriatric face-off, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like again, picking up on each other's mannerisms. Douglas could have done the old Harrison Ford finger, giving it, you know, giving it the. Because yeah. all you all you really need to do to to impersonate Harrison Ford is put your finger in the air and go, "Where's my wife? My my wife? Where's my wife and my family? My family Get and off my, my plane. My my wife? Where's my wife and my family? My family and my wife? And just stick your finger in the air and you're Harrison Ford. <laughs> Uh, then you had Jean Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal. <laughs> that is, uh, and, and that that yeah. that is going right back to the start. That is what this film could have been, and I'm, yeah, gla- exactly. and I'm glad it's not. Um, then you had Bruce Willis and Alec Baldwin. Um, you know, could have been good. Could have been good. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I don't think this was real, but Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, <laughs> which, which uh, so like, yeah, I mean, like, like Heat. <laughs> But with, yeah. but with but with face transplants. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, could, I'd have watched it, obviously. Oh, yeah. that could, yeah, that could have been. Was like, we'll give you Robert De Niro's sort of, you know, paunchy mouth, and uh, you'll give you Pacino's vocal cords so that you can you can really give it the Pacino. Um, <laughs> what, what was the line that he says? Um, <laughs> it's like he, we're looking into a mirror. It like, I'm looking into a mirror, but not. So we'll do that as Al Pacino. So I'd be like, it's like, it's like. Looking into a mirror, only not. <laughs> um, oh, hoo-ah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, who knows if any of that was true? But I like the idea. Uh, and finally, just before shooting emotional scenes, John Woo played soft, sad music to help the actors get into character. John Travolta said he didn't need it. He nailed the scene in one take, earning the nickname "One Take John." 
<laughs> what are we gonna? Again, all right. No citation for that, but you know, I like, it. I like I like that. Oh, do you know what? Travolta has nailed the scene again and again in one take. What kind of catchy nickname should we call him? One take, John. That's the best they could come up with. It's, it, you know, making a movie. Di- making a movie's yeah. difficult. They got a lot to think about. We've, we've not got any more time to dedicate to this. Let's just call him one take, John. Uh, this might not be at the end of Face Off, though, because oh. Paramount Pictures announced in September 2019 plans to remake Face Off with a new cast. Is it? Is it uh, the, the Rock and Kevin Hart? <laughs> That seems to be. They're like. They're always yeah. like. They're always a comedy like, version. It'll be half face off, half twins, won't it? What? It'll no, be that kind of. Genuinely, yeah. genuinely, they've talked about remaking twins with, oh, for with, God's with sake. The Rock and Kevin Hart. Uh, David Permit will be executive producer with Neil Moritz uh, to produce. Um, in February 2021, it was reported that Adam Wingard would direct and the film would actually be a direct sequel to the original. Um, Wingard has already said how the sequel will address the plot hole that saw the two actors' bodies change when they swap faces. <laughs> he said, um, we try to address that in this film because also this is over 20 years later from the first movie, so technology in terms of what in the face-off world they can do has advanced and those kind of things. So we try to make sure that when the stuff comes up that we're checking those boxes and making sure that's addressed. Right. Well, first of all, they did address it in the first one, I think you'll find, with the... He did, yeah. The, lo- the love yeah. handles remark. Secondly, yeah. what is he talking about? What is he talking about? He goes, yeah, times have moved on since Face Off. It wasn't It wasn't possible at the time. He's, yeah. act- he's acting like, that was the technology available at the time, but times have changed <laughs> and we've moved on. That wasn't what the technology was at the time. So technology, no. ha- technology hasn't moved on because it's utter no. nonsense. It's all utter but nonsense. If it- it's, if it's a sequel rather than just a remake, then yeah. does that mean Travolta's going to come back? Is that going to mean that Troy's got some like but, sons or something out there? Or? Surely, actually, no. He does. He does have a son actually, and he appears in this film. So maybe but, it's the son grown up. But, but yeah. no, Tra- having been through all that, Travolta would not volunteer to go through the same procedure. <laughs> he knows. He knows. The, he knows the pitfalls now. Or like maybe like if he does, he's literally telling everyone on the street. He's like, just so you know. Not my, yeah. fa- not this is not my face. If anyone asks, okay. Well, let's let's be clear. Let's uh, let's say it's two new actors. Who would you cast now? Not uh, the Rock and Kevin Hart. Who would you have? The Rock and Vin Diesel. Although that that, oh. that I think that could be. Um... Yeah, imagine because they that'd be great because they fucking hate each other as well. That'd be so good. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that that'd be strong. Who would who would maybe like maybe it should be the kind of people you always oh no do you know it should be mix up the Chris's. So you have like you have like four of them, and they all, and they, <laughs> all four Chris's, and they all and they and they all swap faces, like like yeah. you pass it along the line. So it's like Pine gets Hemsworth's face, Hemsworth gets Pratt, someone gets oh. someone gets Evans. Uh, yeah, no, do it with the Amazing. Chris, do it with the Hollywood Chris's. If they did it in the mid noughties I think they would have had like Matt Damon and Mark Wahlberg because they're quite similar. I think they would have just done that. I think that would have been an easy one. To do. Why would you? <laughs> I like. I like that you're thinking of what's the easiest surgical procedure. <laughs> you know, like, who would be? Who would be good? Who would be good? Uh, uh, well, I feel like it wouldn't take that. The actors are already look exactly the same. <laughs> I feel like. I feel uh. like. I feel like surgically, it wouldn't be that hard to turn Matt Damon into Mark Wahlberg. So let's go with that. Let's go with that. Uh, anyway, um, that is it for Face Off. Um, general thoughts before we head off. I. I'm glad that it's so well liked because it is utter nonsense, but I feel like it's sort of knowing nonsense, right? Like, yeah, exactly. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 knowing well made nonsense, and I but I still think because it is such nonsense, it would be very easy for critics to dismiss it, for it to have been a box office bomb. Um, but in fact, people recognise it for what it is, which is utter gibberish. But a, but a hell of a good time. I've had a great time talking about it, um, <laughs> not even watching it. And yeah. and so yeah, like I'm really glad that it has this this place in the in the pantheon of nonsense but terrific '90s action movies. A, a true classic of its genre. And it's aged well, even though '90s some '90s films, you know, they're a bit a bit ropey. But I, I feel like yeah, of you know, all three of those Cage films, you watch them now and they still hold up and it's still a lot of fun to watch so. i feel like because they were they were ridiculous at the time it's like you yeah, can't exactly again yeah. again something else with cage you can't you can't like he's he's almost like criticism proof and anyone mm. who anyone who's seen the wicker man remake might disagree with me but i feel like 
Cage is so inherently abs- like his performances are so inherently absurd. You can't be like this is ridiculous because it's like well that's that's what he's going for. That's yeah. so yeah. He's he's all he's he's bulletproof. Cage is bulletproof. Well, thanks once again for joining us uh, for Two Geeks, Two Beers. Um, If this is the first time you've listened to us, then you can download and subscribe to all previous episodes, including other action classics such as Die Hard, Mission Impossible, and Licence to Kill, all at twogeekstwobeers.com. You can get us wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Global Player, Podbean, all over the place. Um, And if you really enjoyed this episode, you can support us by becoming a follower on Patreon, just for a little bit of dosh, depending on the different tiers, you can get exclusive outtakes, mini-sodes, uh, two weeks beer mat, even your own episodes, personal videos and other merch. Just head to patreon.com slash twogeekscast. And if you want to get in touch, uh, you can contact us on all, well not all, but certainly a lot of social channels. Uh, we are on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, Two Geeks Cast on all of those. Uh, follow us on there, we'll... Uh, put out little teasers, uh, clips from our latest episodes, and yeah, it's just nice. It's just nice to interact with our fans. Um, <laughs> uh, you can also email us uh, podcast at two geeks two beers dot com. Uh, send us suggestions for future episodes, uh, feedback. You know all all that all that. I, I, Joe, I'm I don't know why I'm so drunk. I'm so drunk. I've had a. I, I'm really not. I'm really not nailing the sales pitch this this episode. But yeah, you can you can you can email us. You can get in touch on on social media. <laughs> Please do. Plus, we are on YouTube as well. If you prefer getting your podcast on there, um, you can just search for us and follow us. And every single episode is on there in full. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. We'll be back next time when Morgan will be teaching me about another pop culture milestone. And um, so. Have a beer on us. We can, as uh, Castor Troy would say himself, we could drink a beer for hours. <laughs> that just makes that just makes it sound like we like don't enjoy beer. Like we're like, <laughs> I've got I've got one pint, and it's going to take me hours. To, and that is certainly that is certainly not the case. actually. I have been known to if I'm at. Uh, house party. I mean, I haven't been to a house party for about fifteen years. But <laughs> if I were at a house party, um, I'd be known to have like a can, which would just last forever. It just for some reason, I just if if it was like a bottle, straight down can. No, take me about three or four hours. But there you go. Cool story, bro. Another, uh, another, anyway, another fascinating insight into the li- into the life of of Tom Eames. There you go. Anyway, cheers and see you next time. <laughs>